and welcome. Thank you for joining us at the kickoff of the At Macaulay Author Series. Tonight we have a very special guest with us. We have Daniel Scapati. He graduated from Brooklyn College for Macaulay Honors College, the class of 2015. And we also have joining him in the discussion is Lee Quinby. I'm just going to read a little bit about Lee Quinby so you all have an idea about all of the great things she's been doing. So Lee Quinby is founder of Lucky Fine Productions and co-founder with Erickson Blanke of the True Delta Project. It's an award-winning filmmaker and American studies scholar. She has written and edited seven books on issues surrounding apocalyptic belief and sexuality and gender in American culture. She received her PhD from Purdue University, taught at Hobart and William Smith Colleges for 23 years, held the Garnet Chair on the Millennium at the Rochester Institute of Technology, the inaugural Zeklin Chair at Brooklyn Colleges, and for six years was distinguished, distinguished lecturer at Macaulay Honors College at CUNY until her retirement teaching in 2014. She is currently a film producer, writer, and director, and specializes in human interest stories that entertain as they educate. Thank you both for being here. We're so excited to have you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Pleasure to be here, an honor. Well, well I'm going to introduce Daniel uh, because um, uh, he's here, of course, as um, an author of the, of the book, Go First, which we're going to see a lot of tonight, hear a lot about tonight. He's got it too, we're all holding our books up. Um, but I'm going to introduce him first as a filmmaker because he has been a filmmaker almost half his life, actually. Quite, quite stunning. We're going to hear a little bit about that tonight. And I want to, um, I should I have begun by thanking Charmaine so much for her introduction. And, uh, and uh, thank you for all who are in attendance. Um, anyway, so uh, filmmaking is the backstory of how I met Daniel, uh, as uh, Charmaine said, back in uh, 2011, I believe it was. And at that time, when I was teaching at Macaulay, Daniel was a Macaulay student at Brooklyn College. And I saw one of his very funny short films, like the Christmas film, Christmas nightmare film, I should say, um, at the first annual CUNY Film Festival, which was at Macaulay and started by another Macaulay student, Daniel Cowan. Uh, and anyway, I was just taken by how skillful it was. So I asked him if he would like to uh, be an intern for the True Delta Project. And um, as Charmaine said, we make documentaries on blues musicians down in Mississippi. We also uh, work with nonprofit organizations that serve disenfranchised youth in, in Mississippi. And um, he started doing that mostly at that time, uh, preparing Kickstarter thank you uh, parcels and taking them to the post office and doing things like that as an intern might. Oh, yes, <laughs> exactly. <That's fine. laughs> but I soon saw that his real value uh, was as a filmmaker, uh, as a cinematographer and editor, and eventually as a co-director. And so um, even when uh, Daniel was still a student, he started working um, on various, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, various uh, films with me. And um, since that time, we uh, he has also uh, co-directed some of the ones for the, about the nonprofit organizations. And um, it's uh, just been a pleasure to work with him, and I really admire his filmmaking, and now I admire uh, his uh, being such a fine author. Uh, so for today, it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel uh, as author of Gophers, as a filmmaker of, of many, many years. And I want to say that uh, one of the pleasures of reading this book is that it's, it is part memoir, and we're going to hear some of that tonight, I hope, but I really recommend uh, the writing style. Uh, is part self-help uh, in terms of all kinds of wonderful, wonderful, uh, not hints, but actually uh, explanations about how one goes about starting um, in this kind of role as a, in this case, a production system. It's very entertaining throughout and exceedingly um, practical as a guide for introductory uh, employment in film and television. Uh, and in fact, any freelance job so Daniel's going to start by um, giving us an overview of his book, and I'm going to stop at this point and turn, turn it over to him. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you very much, Lee. I appreciate it. By the way, before it gets too far away from me, I better share, I'm going to share the screen now because 
uh, if it's sharing properly, you'll see the photos, uh, one with uh, Lee and I up in the, in the top left there, that was back during the CUNY Film Festival, Lee, that, that was taken of us. And then on the bottom right, that's it seems to be one of your favorites when we were shooting down in, uh, in Mississippi, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I liked seeing you put the GoPro on the car. <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing that. I got to learn a lot uh, and I was very grateful for you um, to give me the ability to learn through Delta Project, uh, the True Delta Project. Um, so thank you again for the introduction, Lee uh, and Charmaine and Macaulay. Thank you very much for hosting this. It means a lot sort of coming full circle in a way. I remember talking to uh, Mr. Bill Macaulay at the, uh, the alumni luncheon at the end of uh, my time at Macaulay in 2015 and telling him how I was just going out to begin working full time in film. And I remember he was so interested. He said, what are you doing exactly? And you know, very, I had to explain it a little bit as I do many times, but uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it tonight, as Lee said. Um, I, I'll reshare the screen now because I kind of want to start bridging the two gaps of my work on True Delta and my work in film, uh, narrative film and television production. On the top left of the screen, you see over there, uh, Mr. Johnny Billington, who is one of these terrific blues musicians uh, who's no longer with us, who my first exposure to him was working, as Lee said, uh, kind of in the background on True Delta. Um, and he had this great saying that always stuck with me when he was talking about blues. He said, the blues is how you live. He uh, really spoke a lot about professionalism and self-respect. His students, you know, dressed in suits. And I always thought that was so cool uh, for him and many others showing up was half the battle, you know, to whatever it is that you want to do in whatever walk of life. And then Mr. Rogers, um, another mister, uh, he has this fantastic quote about his time actually working as a gopher, which is uh, an older term for production assistant, but it is uh, still an active term. Um, the other things don't matter as much as human relations, uh, Mr. Fred Rogers learned when he was actually working as a PA uh, on set. Technical knowledge is important, uh, but people skills are really kind of uh, king, uh, especially when it comes to film and, and TV. So. As we've said, my book is called Gophers on the Front Lines of Film and Television. And yes, it is a, it is a real world. People call us PAs nowadays, it's short for production assistants. Um, and we exist in all, all walks of entertainment production from narrative film and television. Some documentaries do have production assistants. I kind of served as one at True Delta in a way in the beginning and kind of ranked up from there with some of my other friends at Dan Cowan and Alana Fahrenbach, some other great Macaulay students. Um, and if you look up Gophers in the dictionary, you know, we are defined in the Oxford English Dictionary, at least, as a person who runs errands, especially on a film set or in an office, which I always appreciated. Uh, film set is specific. These are some other former PAs that are some of the more notable ones you're probably familiar with. On the left, you have Kathleen Kennedy on the bottom there. She started out as Steven Spielberg's personal PA and worked her way up. Uh, for better or worse, what's happened with the Star Wars films, whichever way you go. Um, you know, what, what, we'll leave that point by itself, but Christy Wilson Carnes on the top left, she's a writer, Star Wars, she started out as a PA. Of course, Paul Thomas Anderson, the center, very well-known film director, started out as a PA. Uh, Regis Philbin and Aubrey Plaza on the right, they both started out as NBC Pages, uh, which is NBC's version of a production assistant. They call it a page. ABC News, I once learned, at a Macaulay event actually calls production assistants, desk assistants. So depending on where you go and what industry you're talking about, the term, it's it's it, it's always a little bit different, but it always means essentially the same thing. We're supporting the production. Um, I'll set the warlike stage for you because I think this is an important place to start. Production assistants. Uh, this photo is from pre-pandemic, but you know, not not a tremendous amount has changed here. Uh, this is kind of what your set will usually look like if you're working in the narrative space of a film or television show. This this job of PA, it's the unofficial entry level job for pretty much all of the different industries, film, TV, it's a minimum wage job. The office moves daily. Uh, the office is our set. If you're a set PA, and even if you work in the office with producers or production management, uh, your job really only lasts as long as the production itself. So you only have an office for a certain amount of time and then it's on to the next one. Uh, unless you work full time at say, Warner Brothers Studios to an executive or something along those lines. Uh, coworkers change constantly every day. Bosses always shout at you. I don't know what it is, but they shout like drill sergeants and they do it over walkie talkies where we use things, uh, we use them to communicate with military lingo, saying things like copy that, 10-1, wheels up, the one wheels up. All this, all this lingo that we use all the time, it creates this feeling of pressure and speed. Everybody's moving at a really fast rate because we're all under pressure to get the job done as quickly as possible, uh, especially when it comes to the huge budget 
film and TV shows. Um, and also PA responsibilities could really be anything, kind of much like in the military where you never know quite what's gonna happen, uh, whether you're in a field or working in a prep position. Uh, my responsibilities ranged from unclogging toilets to triggering literal explosions on set um, with FX departments, it was, it was crazy. And I'm drawing attention here, if you didn't notice it, you know, on the bottom left, you've got a bloody body there shot by a man with a pistol on the right. You've got this goon holding a machine gun. Even without these actual military elements, the daily grind of being a production assistant is always there. You're always running and it feels like you're in a, a military situation. And a lot of times, strangely enough, it's the norm. And if you needed any more proof that this job is, you know, can be stressful, just look at me. I, I look at this photo, I look at it with such fondness, but at the same time, I look so constipated. I don't know what it was that day. It was a very stressful day, actually. This is me sitting on an Apple box, this little um, black box that my, my butt is on there. Uh, and I was seated offset, uh, feeding lines to an actor. I'll stop sharing for a moment to say what happened was uh, the assistant directors knew we had uh, two very big A-list talent coming in to this one narrative production I was working on. And one of them was a little bit older. He was wearing an ear wig in his ear. Uh, it's a small little receiver device so somebody could speak into it and feed him his lines because he wasn't able to remember them. So they delegated this task to me. This was a little bit later in my PA career. And again, these were these were you know well-known A-list actors and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have to feed him his lines. The other part of it was I had to wear the headphones and, and use the script because I listened to the other A-list actor say his lines on set. Then before my actor was supposed to begin speaking, I needed to start reading his lines. Then I would hear him saying the line a few seconds after I started reading it. And the first time it didn't go so well. It's a lot to juggle in the head, uh, but I got it eventually and it turned out okay. Um, this is one of the jobs that you have as a production assistant. You never know what's gonna happen. It could just be thrown at you in the middle of the day. Um, so everyone has done a very good job of introducing me. Just to clarify, I started out with pretty much zero connections to this industry. Uh, my mother is an assistant special education teacher. My dad is a dentist, small family office. So I was very far removed from Hollywood. I really didn't know much about uh, film and TV production when I started out. Um, I started doing free work, searching a lot on Craigslist like a lot of people do. Um, whoops, skip the screen there. Uh, yeah, I, I started out basically not knowing where to go or what to do, and I kind of had to rank my way up the same way that a lot of people do. All the people that you just saw on that former PA screen, they started out not knowing what to do either. Uh, it wasn't begin uh, easy in the beginning. It's a freelance job. It's a gig-based industry. Uh, unless you're working at one of those studios, you go from job to job, um, and it's not easy. Uh, before I start sharing the screen again, by the way, I'd love to draw attention to, there's a QA and a button apparently. So at any time during my slideshow here, I have a couple slides to share, but feel free to ask a question and I'll actually pause. Uh, anyone can let me know, either uh, Lee or Charmaine, let me know and I'll stop and take a look at the question. So feel free. Uh, you're probably asking yourself right now, why on earth would anyone want to do this? This must sound like a stressful job to you because, I mean, it does to me when I think about it. And the honest to God, simple answer is it's a stepping stone position. It's it's nothing that uh, I, I met no one who wanted to be a PA their entire career. It's where it all starts uh, in many cases, uh, wherever, whichever industry you're talking about, news or, or what have you. Um, and I want you to take it from somebody who knows a lot more uh, you know, stuff than I do. Somebody who's much smarter than me, I think, Liz Gill. She's a, an assistant director who works over in the UK. Now she's a director and executive producer. And she has this great book called Running the Show, which uh, is very, it's very good read if you want to be an assistant director. Uh, it's a fantastic quote that I actually want to read because it, it paints the picture well. Inside every person on a film set, including the caterers and even the surliest electrician on the truck, somewhere exists the romantic child who was first dazzled by the silver screen. It's a romantic way of putting it, but we are all really those children on these sets who first somewhere were dazzled by some movie, it was Jurassic Park for me, that said, oh my gosh, it just lit off in my head. How do I go and do that? Where do I begin? Maybe for you, it was a movie or a TV show or a news piece, what have you. Um, there are benefits to this job. If I've made it sound kind of bad so far and rough and tough, there's reasons you'd wanna do this. Free food's a big one, I'm not gonna lie. That picture on the right is taken from an actual CBS sitcom uh, craft service room. And I mean, look at the name brand treats we get. 
I grew up not not really having name brand treats. I love my mom, but I didn't get many name brand treats when I was a kid. So this was a huge deal for me. I, it felt like a kid in a candy store, literally, when I started working as a PA. But it gets better than the food. There's things like gambling. Uh, we have this game called Cards that uh, everybody on films and TV shows on Fridays, you buy two decks of cards, you sell the cards from one deck, and then you pull three from the other deck and somebody wins the whole pot. Uh, it's, it's a fun little game that keeps everybody uh, happy uh, after a long week too. Uh, and there's the proximity to gear. It doesn't really matter if you want to work on a technical position, camera, uh, hair, makeup, you're always going to be around people who know what they're talking about and are using the best gear around. Uh, and the biggest benefit of all, do I have to say, it's just awesome stuff. I know where Sesame Street is now. My whole childhood, I went through my life asking that age old question. Can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street? Well, I know how now. You go to Kaufman Astoria Studios and it's on stage, Jay. So uh, that was a huge, a huge day for me. <laughs> Daniel, just a quick question from the audience. So Let's we hear have it. Gav, for someone who has worked for so long behind the camera, how have you gotten yourself so comfortable in front of it? Mm. That's a pretty good question. I, in a way, I've kind of always straddled the line between the two of them. Uh, I started out actually in middle school. I went to Robert H. Goddard Middle School 202 and we had a public television show. They had a full broadcast studio back in 2006, I think it was. They had the studio in the basement. And I remember that was around the time I saw Jurassic Park a little before that. And I said, oh, I want to work with cameras. And they said, well, we actually need a host for this public school. It was a region five television show called Alive and Five. They said, do you want to, we are, we're going to be able to pull you out of class in the middle of the day. You could come down to the studio, learn some gear and you could host the show. I said, okay, great. So somewhere in my basement, there's old DVDs of a young me in middle school hosting a show. That was my beginning of being comfortable in front of the camera. I did some community theater in, uh, in high school and college too. So it's a very good question. I like to think I'm okay in front of the camera. Please tell me if I'm not. <laughs> Another story I wanted to share uh, about those intangible experiences, which is my favorite part of the job. Uh, this is Leon Rippey here on the right. He is a, a very uh, famous uh, character actor, a uh, really talented performer uh, who I admire a great deal. And, you know, we got an awesome photo here. I may look like I'm geeking out. And that's because I was the first day that he showed up on set. Uh, I recognized him. He played the mayor of this movie called Eight Legged Freaks, which was about these giant spiders that invade a town. And I, I always loved this movie. It was another one of my favorite silver screen moments. And I saw him on set and I didn't recognize him at first. And I'm thinking and I say to him, I, you know what, I, I don't geek out on anybody. I don't want a fanboy here, but I love Jane Eight-Legged Freaks. And he was just, he laughed so hard saying, nobody ever talks to me about that movie. That was so long ago. And it started a great conversation. We became good friends over the course of his time on that show. Um, one of many wise friends that I made, not just in front of the camera, but there's wonderful technicians I worked with who you wouldn't know their names on the back of the, uh, behind the camera. But Leon told me this great story that I think is applicable anywhere. There was a production assistant he worked with in LA who was always on time and always did the right job. And he worked really hard for his ADs. And there was a one day where the ADs apparently had a rough time. He overslept. The ADs are calling this PA, not Leon, but the PA overslept. Uh, the ADs are calling the PA. The PA is not picking up. Well, Leon's on set and he sees the PA run in four hours late and he's panting. And apparently the ADs just totally, you know, tore the guy a new one, as they say, they, they really didn't go easy on him. And uh, they said some nasty things to him. And Leon said that that PA left the industry the next day, he quit the job, uh, and he never saw him on another set again. Um, and it's tough, because that's, that's, he, it led him to say that the best piece of advice that he could give me, Leon, uh, if he could tell me anything about this industry, it's grow a thick skin. Uh, it's, it's important to know that no matter where you go, there's always going to be stress. There's always going to be people running to get things done. And people might say things that they don't mean because they're having a stressful day. Uh, so I like to, I like to kind of live that lesson and say, uh, let's not take it so seriously, especially film and television. Yes, we have a job to do. Uh, and you should do your job first when you're a production assistant. I, I like to think I always did my job first. And then after my job was done, then I would ask questions and then I'd go over to the director. And if he was nice enough or she was nice enough, I would ask a question or two and they would be very generous in answering. Same for 
hair and makeup. Uh, really, everywhere I went, I, I tried to soak up as much knowledge as I could. Did I see another question pop up there? I might have. Yes. So there is a question from Joe. Are there any specific connections you can draw between your Macaulay experience and the PA path? And it's in brackets, the internship and the work with Professor Quinby for sure, but anything in addition to that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Hello, Professor Ugritz. It's good to see you virtually at least. Um, Lee mentioned that early on, uh, yeah, I held this up before, one of my earlier jobs was working to you know, prepare goodies for our Kickstarter backers uh, and taking a job as simple, you know, you could, you could say, what a bad job. Oh, I'm just sitting in a mail room all day, packing envelopes, mailing them out, getting it done. By being in that room, I got to chat with Professor Quinby about a lot of things. I got to chat with Dan Cowan, uh, or Cohen, excuse me, who was um, the cinematographer on True Delta. And we worked together many times after that. He told me how to use cameras. He taught me a lot about lenses that I really didn't learn uh, in my other classes at Brooklyn College. So being there, like I was just saying, being in a situation like that, like an internship at Macaulay, uh, going in with the mindset that, sure, maybe what I'm doing today, packing envelopes is not what I'd like to do my entire life, um, but it's a great start and I don't know what I'm gonna learn there. It enabled me to have a conversation uh, that, that grew and I was able to take the lessons I learned and apply them on more professional sets. Uh, and that's the truth. That's just how I look at it. I still look at it that way every day, no matter the job I have. I try to learn what I can, whether I'm sweeping floors as a production assistant or whether I'm charged with shooting and directing a video. I, I just try to be open-minded about it. So I, I'm going to jump in just for a minute, if that's okay. Of course. Um, so I uh, was the, uh, the professor when I uh, asked uh, both Daniels <laughs> to start working with me. But I have to say that they were the teachers much of the time in terms of filmmaking, because I made the first film with Daniel Cowan, and then after that, uh, Danny, the second Daniel, who I call Danny Boy, to distinguish him <laughs> from, to, between the two Daniels, um, you know, he, he taught me what I needed to know about where the camera was to be placed. Sometimes they would let me do the second camera because, you know, I, it could be a still camera and I don't know how to operate it otherwise. Um, but really, I, I think the, to answer Joe's question more fully, the tables were turned and I was the student much of the time and, and Daniel, both Daniels were the teachers. Okay, go back to your, <laughs> you have some more to tell us about your book, but I did want to get I, that in. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I am humbled to hear that because it, it illustrates the point very well that it was a trade-off. We learned things from one another, especially in those early internship internship phases uh like i said i learned a lot when when we traveled down to mississippi uh, i learned a lot about field producing and working with local uh hotels to book the rooms um a lot of tv shows yes maybe on a feature film big blockbuster film production assistants wouldn't be doing that booking hotel rooms but on some jobs I went to work on that were non-union, low-level independent projects, I did a lot of the same work that I, I was doing at Withley and learning from her uh, on a producing scope when she was producing and directing her film. So all of those little things, uh, I think you're a great camera operator, by the way, uh, don't sell yourself short. I think we learned a lot from one another too. You're not wrong. Oh, another Actually, question. oh yeah, go ahead, another question. Another question. So advice for when you are in between PA gigs. Oh, in between PA gigs. That's a very good, yeah, that's a good point. Cause actually I, I'll broaden that question to say when you're in between gigs in general, because in the end, in showbiz, remember that whether you're even the biggest Hollywood directors uh, and the lowest level PAs, we're all only as good as the last job. Uh, okay, yes, maybe somebody like Steven Spielberg, he's going to be all right from job to job, no problem. Uh, but a lot of people, the cast, the crew, we do have to fill the gaps between the work. Uh, in the beginning, I used my time as excuses to make more things. It's something I'll mention a little bit later, but if I ever had time, free time, uh, I would sometimes make a video for YouTube, uh, which uh, Lee mentioned seeing one of my earlier ones at one of the film festivals at, at uh, CUNY back in the day. Sometimes I'd make videos and put them on YouTube uh, as I started working on set and uh, started living in the adult world and needing to pay for uh, tax preparation and uh, bills, get the bills paid. I started doing things like stock trading and, and finding uh, time to use my off time for side gigs, uh, whether it be go out and shoot a video for one day or buy and sell some stocks. Um, 
lately that's kind of blown up with GameStop and things like that. So it's another world today. But when I started out, I, I moved a bit more slower than everyone seems to move today. Uh, so it's a, it's a good tip to try to find, try to find ways to make the off time work for you. Uh, and, and don't let it, don't let yourself sit stagnant because, you know, you're not working on a set. It kind of leads me to describe that there are some different types of productions. Uh, if I hadn't done a good job of explaining it so far, and this could be a whole discussion, so I'll just keep this short and simple. Single camera is basically your feature films. Uh, there are TV shows that count. Think shows like The Office or Stranger Things, Game of Thrones. Those kinds of shows are shot like feature films. You have kind of a wide master shot that gets every every piece of action, and then you move to one side of the uh, action where you film one actor on a medium and a close-up, and then you turn the cameras around and get the other side. That's kind of the way single cameras work. Multi-cameras are a little bit different. Uh, they're think more like sitcoms or news shows, talk shows, where you have sometimes a live TV audience and there's four or five cameras that shoot all the action simultaneously. So they're a little bit faster uh, than single camera productions, but they're also lit much more uh, globally level. So they're not as dramatic. Uh, there's not as much time spent on individual so uh, shots. Um, they're cheaper to shoot though. Commercials sort of bridge the gap. Uh, obviously, you have things like Super Bowl commercials, which are big union productions that the pool of talent who work on those is very small. Um, and then there's local television commercials that you probably know of. New media is a broad category that uh, originally started out as web content um, and Netflix and Hulu were there. But now many unions have fought to recategorize them and uh, they have been recategorized. Uh, I keep mentioning unions and I'll say that, again, this could be a whole other discussion, but some some productions, once you reach a certain point uh, and you want to work with a certain caliber of talent, whether it be Steven Spielberg, whether it be working on a television show like ABC News, a lot of the big productions are unionized and everybody there is a member of a trade union or a director's guild or a producer's guild. So when you reach a certain point, uh, you probably will have to consider joining a union to go forward, but it's not mandatory. There's a lot of other options in that commercial new media world. There's corporate video. Nowadays, we have things like Quibi and IGTV and Facebook Watch, and the world is exploding and everybody's rushing to catch up to try to get a piece of the pie, so to speak, but also to represent everyone fairly. So there's there's two sides to it. Did I see another question pop up? Maybe, let me see here. There are a couple of them. So oh. let me go with the first one from Margaret. Book writing is solitary, Film filmmaking is group crowds of people endeavor. Are you comfortable alone and in a group or in group projects? That, that is a very good question. Yeah, book writing, it, it's funny. I, well, Margaret, I miss the, I, I miss the camaraderie uh, that was on sets right before this, this COVID-19 pandemic hit our world. It's still there. It's a little different now. And I'm sure everybody misses the way that it was in offices. I mean, it's not just film sets. A lot of people miss the way things were. But when I took to book writing, uh, this book Gophers that I kind of had on the back burners, when everything uh, got crazy. I, I'd been thinking to myself, I should write a book about how to become a production assistant because every time I'd go to a college event, people would ask me, how do you do it? What did you do? Uh, I figured I could share my lessons in some way and eventually it turned into a very solitary process of writing a book. I don't necessarily like one more than the other. Um, I like the onset camaraderie and I like seeing other people's faces, but it's nice to retreat every now and again. Uh, and screenwriters face the same thing every day when they work on screenplays. I mean, they work on set, but they're also working on the back burners. You kind of find a balance, I guess is the best way to put it. I don't prefer one over the other, if that makes sense. So next question is from Maureen. How do you continue to maintain such a positive attitude when dealing with such difficult jobs or challenging people to work with. And I think this can easily go to you too, Lee So for is, both of you. How do you stay positive? I, I always have liked working with you, Lee, because you also have a very positive attitude. And sometimes our positivity and politeness conflict because uh, we, we, we say, why, thank you, after you, no, no, after you, back and forth. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll quickly answer and say, um, I'm not always this way. There's days where I'm very upset and very frustrated. And uh, I'll, I'll mention one of the, there's a story I have later that I'll share with you. I like 
to keep looking forward and like the song and Avenue Q goes, uh, not to spoil it for you, but it's been out for two decades or something. So go watch it. It's a great musical. At the end, it goes, it's only for now. There's a whole song. It's only for now. Everything is just for now. And there's always going to be a tomorrow. Uh, I may not be doing what I want to be doing today, but tomorrow I'm going to be doing something better than I was today. I try to look forward. I'm not sure how I do it, to be honest. I don't know. What do you have to say about it, Lee? Keeping positive. <laughs> I was born that way. <laughs> Frankly, I've just, uh, you know, just feel cheerful mo most of the time. <laughs> so I think, I guess, um, my mother and father are responsible. But anyway, it's, it's fortunate to, you know, to have a, a cheery outlook and things come your way as a result. So. Um, I have a question uh, that I, I want to ask you, um, just in terms of the book. Um, so, you know, this may overlap with some one of your slides, so you go ahead and decide how you want to do it. But um, I, I think you have one coming up that talks about approaching people and that this, it's not who you, it's not who you know, it's who you don't know. And I, I particularly like that whole chapter in your book um, because uh, even though I'm a cheerful person, it's hard for me to go up to strangers and, and start talking about something. And, and your line of work, you have to do that all the time. You're, you're the new person on a set. You don't know anybody. You have to make connections. And, and you've just been, um, I think, very good at that. And you have a whole chapter on how you um, find out by meeting someone new, a whole chain of other kinds of possibilities have come into your life. So if you would talk about that some, I think it would be really instructive. Yeah, absolutely. That actually, it ties in well with something I'll show you in a second. But I, uh, I would say that I like to remember what the misters said, both Mr. Johnny Billington and Mr. Fred Rogers at the beginning of the slides. Uh, it's a lifestyle, it's a way you live, it's a mindset that you put yourself in, and it's all about human interactions and human relations. Um, people would always say to me when I was a kid and even in college, it's all about who you know, you gotta know the right people. And I appreciate you for, for recognizing Lee that, yeah, I, I kind of turned it on its head when I started working in film production. And I, I thought about it, well, it's really all about who you don't know because your next job, your next period of employment as a freelancer or a gig worker, uh, or even if you're not, if you're working salary, wherever you're working, you never know where the next conversation is going to lead you with relationships, uh, with spirituality, with just about anything in your life. Uh, and I, I learned early on that talking to people, my mother kind of taught me this when she helped get me my first paying job ever. I think it was, it was working, cleaning a, cleaning a food truck a block away from me. There was a man who was always cleaning this food truck and I, my mom always saw him bending over and hurting his back. And she drove me over there one day and said, look, I'm going to show you, let's, let's talk to the man. So we went over there, we said hi. Uh, and she, you know, she said, do you need help? And I, he hired me right on the spot. He said, you're a block away, come over after school every day. Uh, I'll pay you $20 for two hours. I was blown away because that three days and I'm going to get a new video game every week. That's what I was thinking back when I was 12, 13. Um, so I, I took it and then I saw very early on, thanks to mom and other people in my life. If you go and put yourself out there and make it known what make others know what you want, uh, it can only lead to good things. That slide that I wanted to share kind of highlights this a little bit. Uh, I won't dwell on this too long, but this is kind of an overview of general paths that you can have working on a set. Uh, it all starts as an additional where you kind of a daily hire employee. This is on particularly busy day. Say there's a, a bunch of moving elements and they need extra PAs. Uh, in the film and television world or commercials or news shows, they'll sometimes bring in additional help. And while you're there as an additional, you're only gonna be working for maybe one day a week, but once your job is done, if I'm hired to clean this, I'm gonna clean that. And then as soon as I'm done cleaning it, I'm gonna start talking to other people. And then hopefully that will lead you to either the office, uh, the set, or if you'd like to apprentice in a specific department, there's these kind of these three main routes you can go. So if you're not putting yourself out there, this is not really gonna happen for you, I found. You have to be very lucky for something to be just dropped into your lap. Uh, if, you, if you go any of these routes, you can see that you kind of want to work your way up the ladder on the set PA. There's assistant directors is kind of the next step. And you always want to be networking as you're a second second. You want to talk to other second ADs, which is the next rank up. And then you want to talk to other first ADs and you want to learn from them and see which first AD is going to need a second AD so you can get that job on the next project. It's the same in the office. Working with producers, you start as a producer's assistant and you talk to the next level. You constantly put yourself out there. And that's kind of why that little graphic of the map with the arrow is there. Um, 
you're always going all over the place. You never really know where you're going to land. It's kind of like a, a roulette table. You're just going to spin it. And as long as you are putting yourself out there and playing the game, you're going to go somewhere. That's the easiest way to put it. <laughs> Let's see here. Well, there is a few questions. So I just wanted to, I'm going to jump around a little bit out of order. This question is actually for Professor Quinby. How is the pandemic affecting your work in the industry? Well, um, I, actually, I've been uh, doing my work as um, a professor more and during the pandemic. I've, I was asked to write an essay on uh, um, apocalypticism and critical theory. So I've been reading some heavy duty critical theorists for uh, the last uh, year and, and writing that just finished that essay. And uh, so really I put the uh, filmmaking uh, on the side a bit. Um, I made the last film just before I went into lockdown um, um, what about one of the blues musicians down in Mississippi. So uh, that's available like other ones uh, to see on, on the Vimeo on demand. But uh, other than that, you know, no trips down to Mississippi. Daniel and I have talked about some Rockaway ideas and we'll, we'll get to that once we can actually get out and about and see people more. But thank you for asking. And we've been doing some safe filming too, a little safe filming in Rockway early on. Uh, one or one of us went out and it was it was safe and uh, we kept very distance in the car. You know, you keep the projects alive as you go. There's, there's ways to do it. So kudos. The next question is from Eric and Brittany. What was your longest day of filming and how did it affect you? Oh, geez. That could really go for either of us. Hello, Eric and Brittany. Um, oh, man. Um, I... There, there's too many to mention. There were so many. I think honestly, if it, my longest day hour wise was 19 hours on set. Uh, if I didn't mention it earlier, when you work as a product, when you work in film and TV, the average length of a day is 12 hours. It's kind of important thing to uh, don't want to forget that. A lot of people go in saying I have to work 12 hours a day. Sometimes I have to stand for all those hours. Um, it affected me by building up my calves to a massive level because my legs were always getting a workout. So I have rather large calves. I'm only kidding. They're not that big. Um, it, it increased my tolerance to withstand certain difficult jobs. And a lot of those things I was talking about earlier on, uh, sometimes sweeping the floors or like I said, I've cleaned up cast bathrooms. Uh, it, it lets you know that okay, I'm doing this right now, but I know there's something else coming because that 19 hour day I worked just yesterday proves to me that I'll only be doing this for about 10, 15 minutes and then someone's gonna ask me to do something. Uh, sometimes really good things happen when you're a set PA. Uh, this picture on the right here, uh, that was on the left, I'll say that was me locking up a library with a good friend of mine, uh, Alex Alfonsi, really talented PA, better than I am to be honest, better than I was. But on the right, sometimes you'll be a PA on an independent set uh, or a small set, and they'll need an extra uh, performer to step in. And they, this particular scene was from a movie called Two Weeks, a short film I worked on here in Queens, very talented team of filmmakers. They needed to fill the background a little bit more. So I happened to be wearing a nice button down shirt as the gaffer, which is the chief electrician on set that day. And they said, Dan, get in the back there. Please sit down behind him. And I, I didn't mind. Of course I'll get on camera. Why not? I didn't have any lines, but I got to see what it was like on that side of the camera. So again, things happen that keep you engaged, whether or not you're asking for them to happen. <laughs> Let's see here. The next question is actually coming from Dean Pearl. Do you think you might write a screenplay or a TV series about gophers? Dean Pearl, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you for the question. I, uh, I I respect that question a great deal because yes, you are very astute in, the, in your observation. My goal is to take the stories that I have put down in this book and there's other PAs that I got in this book. That I'll say very quickly, I didn't want to come off as somebody who knows it all because there's other PA books out there. Something I didn't like about a few of them was that they were a little too much like a textbook. Uh, they didn't read like a storybook and I enjoy telling stories. I have a YouTube channel where I share stories. I share stories with my friends all the time. Uh, and when I make them laugh, I have a lot of fun doing that. So my book has a lot of stories in it uh, and it tells the story, the overall story of a production assistant, but I would like to take those stories. And yes, I do see turning them into some kind of a television show. I think it would work better as a series, but I'm still figuring that out. So stay tuned and maybe I'll be back sometime in the near future uh, talking about a different project. <laughs> okay, one other question. 
Is self-publishing a very difficult process to learn? How did you learn to self-publish a book? You keep learning all the time on film and TV, as well as in writing. That's, that's, that is another very good question. Uh, much like working on set as a production assistant, there's a lot of paths that you can go. Um, I decided early on that I wanted to try my hand at going the traditional published route. So I wrote a proposal for my book uh, and I had samples uh, and, I, and I started querying for agents and I did actually sign with a literary agent. I was represented for, uh, for about a year and we uh, shopped my idea around right up to the beginning of the pandemic at some major houses and something I saw just like the movie production industry, the traditional publishing industry, everything moves very slowly. Um, Lee answered a lot of my questions because she had she has multiple books under her name prior, and I got to learn from her. I got to learn from other writers uh, who told me, well, you could go this way, you could go that way. But the self-publishing route, I'll be honest, it was pretty difficult to wrap my head around because there's so much. I mean, there's the cover, there's the editing, there's multiple stages of editing, there's designing the interior. There's a lot that goes into making a book. And I like to think I did a pretty good job on my own, uh, but I'll leave you to be the judge. Uh, pick up a copy and, and leave a review. And if I did a horrible job, don't feel free to say so because it's only gonna help me grow. Uh, and I, I actually, that's, you know what, that's a good way to chime into I, I, this, this screen I really want to share. Um, this job can be a pain in the butt. People can be a pain in the butt sometimes. Not that anyone here is a pain in the butt, but I'm just saying it happens, uh, especially in Hollywood. There's all these reasons. I'm not going to go through them all, but there's all these reasons that I do want to remind people. And I wish I was reminded when I started that working in film and television can be very difficult. You always have people yelling at you. Sometimes you get bullied. Uh, Edward Zwick, another director, marriages, if they last, they're unconventional at best. I always love that quote uh, from 1997, but it holds too true today. Uh, I had multiple people who I knew, who I worked with, who, you know, rest their souls. I, I had a friend who suicided that I knew. I, I knew friends who had drug overdoses and are no longer with us. Um, it's like a rock star life. I mean, you hear these stories and I don't want to make it sound like every day there's something like this going on. It's not the case, uh, but I was regularly exposed to people experiencing problems. And I myself, if you saw the scalpel on that little screen there, uh, there was a job where I worked a, a very long series of days as an unpaid intern. Uh, and at the end of all these days, I, I was working in the locations department and I was hopping in and out of my car and driving to and from all these different sets. And this was a small non-union production. Um, and I did this all summer and the hours were 16 hours a day and it was very early on in my career. So I wasn't take caring of, uh, taking care of myself. I wasn't showering. I was sweaty. It was really bad. I wasn't eating. At the end of this two week, you know, debacle, I, I go in the shower to finally decompress and I'm showering and I see blood pooling in my feet. And I'm looking down thinking, what the heck is going on? <laughs> Where is this coming from? And I, I wasn't smiling then. And I found that basically after going to get my situation diagnosed and, and discovering that I had a, a small pin sized hole on my lower back, I found that I had a polynidal cyst. Uh, and if you've never heard of a polynidal cyst, uh, they call it Jeep cyst. It's from World War II when people, soldiers were hopping in and out of Jeeps um, all day long and they would develop this cyst on their lower back right at the top of their behind uh, and it needed to be surgically removed. And they said to me, have you been doing a lot of jumping in and out of a car for some reason? Have you been running around this summer? Are you taking care of yourself or you're not showering? I learned pretty hard right then that I, I better start taking care of myself because no one else is going to do that for me. And I had to lay on my stomach for about three weeks. And that was not pleasant. I was out of commission for the rest of that summer, did not work on anything else. <laughs> uh, is that another question I see? Could yes. I be wrong? So there's a question from Alan. With the recent news accusations about the toxic working environment on Joss Whedon's set and the general history of the film industry turning a blind eye toward abusive behavior, especially targeting female casting crew members, I'm curious how you think about the line between needing to grow a thick skin versus choosing to speak out against language and behavior that would be unacceptable in almost every other profession especially for a low status position like a PA? That is not only a very good question, but it's a very important one. Um, I saw myself, I can tell you from the experience that I have, which is, which is me as a, as a young 
uh, white Italian American, uh, Irish American man who worked on sets. Uh, I saw and witnessed and ha had things that happened to me uh, that made me feel uncomfortable and people treated me certain ways and sometimes I would call them out and other times I'd be too afraid to. Uh, matter of fact, in the beginning of my career, I didn't wa want to rock the boat, uh, as they say, because I was worried that I'm just a PA, I'm, I'm going to get fired. Uh, it, we're so easily replaceable because there's so many of us. I, like I said earlier, I'm not the best one. I'm not the only one. There's tons of us everywhere in all walks of entertainment. Um, and I have friends uh, who were different colors. I have friends who were different genders. Uh, and they said a lot of things to me that I would realize a lot of us take a verbal mental beating uh, on, a, on a pretty regular basis. I think a lot of people's assistants uh, share stories like this. That's why you always see people coming out with books that are tell-alls uh, and, and people love to share about the bad. Um, I'll actually share this screen again because I think my another PA who I know very well and is really fantastic uh, down at the bottom there, her name is Libby Gardner. Uh, Libby, when I asked her to, to consider writing something for the book, a lesson that she wanted to, say, to share, she actually wrote that line about she endured sexist comments, like smiled for me. She, had produ she told me producers would come up to her and give her these unwanted shoulder rubs just randomly when she was working in the office. Uh, and I heard stories like that from uh, female PAs that I worked with, and I knew that they weren't happy about it. Uh, and she actually said, I learned it's important to identify your boundaries and speak up when they're crossed. She said it better than I could. Uh, I, I think that in the beginning, I didn't do it. I didn't speak about certain things that I knew were wrong because I was afraid. And now I've reached a point in my career where I know I have uh, enough, I bring enough value to the table. And I think any production assistant of every uh, race, color, creed, nationality, gender, they all bring something very important to the table. And anybody who doesn't treat them good, uh, you shouldn't stand for it. And you should just politely leave the set, not come back, and find a different job. Um, there's there's a line in the beginning of your career where you want to put up with things and you want to show you're a team player uh, and you want to build those connections and you want to have those conversations. Uh, but if you're ever put in an uncomfortable situation, it's just not worth it because there's other people out there who are much better than whoever's treating you poorly. I guess that's that's the, probably the, the clearest way that I can, I can put it. And I hope that kind of answers the question. Um, it, it actually ties in with another kind of funny story, uh, semi-funny, not really funny, but there's this, a lot of, some of you may have heard of Haskell Wexler, a famous, uh, he's also no longer with us, but a famous uh, a cinematographer, a member of the ASC, the Union of Cinematographers, the Guild, and he made this great movie. It's available on Vimeo, just like a lot of Lee's films. Um, this one's called Who Needs Sleep? And it's really a fantastic movie that explores, uh, this was in the late 90s, there was a camera operator on the movie Pleasantville, I think his name was Brent Hirschman. He died uh, at the end of a very long day on set because of sleep deprivation. He, he decided to get in a car. I think it was after a 16 or 19 hour day, he decided to get in a car and drive home and he fell asleep on the road uh, and he got into a crash and he died. He didn't live it. Uh, and Haskell Wexler made this documentary about working in the industry and to what extent people will go, um, how far people will push themselves to work in Hollywood or to work in such a glamorous industry. Um, and this is a story that you hear in other industries too. I've heard it in the fashion industry. I have friends who work even in the medical industry in some cases. I have some friends who really wanna be like the big shot at the hospital and they'll push themselves to ways that they're not sleeping and then they're not as far as malpractice or anything, but they're not giving the best uh, performance and doing the best job that they could be. Uh, so it is important to know your own boundaries because nobody else is gonna watch out for you. You have to do that. Uh, I myself on that screen there, that, that image on the left is of my, my 1999 Nissan Altima, the first college car that I had that my parents graciously bought for me, a nice old used one with 100,000 miles. Well, I, I fell asleep on the road too, and I'm, I'm, I was embarrassed to talk about it in the beginning, but it was the end of a series of 20 hour days, if I remember correctly, or 19 hour days, just like Brent Hirschman. And uh, that's the damage you could see right in front of the, the tire there. It doesn't really look that bad uh, where the paint is scraped off uh, just, just to the right of the tire. But I was driving home and it was very late and I was extremely tired. And I remember my eyes closing. And if you watch the documentary, Who Needs Sleep? You learn about this thing called micro sleeps. I remember going through these micro sleeps where I was just seeing flashes of the drive, but I knew the drive because it was my normal drive home. And then all of a sudden I see these sparks shooting up along the side of the car next to where the, the, the 
that metal piece of my car met against the uh, the metal wall of the highway. And I was awake then, and I got home safe then. That moment has never left me. So sometimes it's not emotional or mental combat. Sometimes it's just you yourself. You can't physically push yourself far enough to make everybody happy. That's something very important I learned early on. Uh, and I and I never have done that again. And I know my boundaries. And if I'm ever getting tired, uh, I'm not embarrassed to say it anymore because if anyone makes fun of me, again, I've, I have reached a point where it's just not worth it. I'm just not gonna stay around and let you, you know, literally potentially kill me or someone else. This happens and it's and it's it's real and I believe it needs to be addressed more so and better than it has been in the past. There was a whole movement about uh, that Who Needs Sleep was about uh, 12 on, 12 off, work 12 hours, have 12 hours off. Those things should probably happen and be a little bit more in the spotlight of conversation nowadays. Um, there's this thing called the project management triangle and it's really, really boring and tedious, but the simple way to put it is you can have in this triangle, there's three good things and three bad things. You could have two of the good and one of the bad. You can't have all three good. So if you want something good and fast, it's going to be expensive. If you want something good and cheap, it's going to be slow. It's going to take time. People need to be reminded, really slow down. Not everybody operates this way. As a production assistant, you can't always be the person who steps in and says, we need to slow down, but there are outlets to go through. Many networks and studios have anonymous hotlines that can be called nowadays, which is something that wasn't there when I started as a PA full-time in 2015. Uh, at least some of the places I was working at, these hotlines were only recently introduced. Um, and that's, that's an invaluable resource that a lot of times if you start on a job, they'll be very clear in your start paperwork, who you can go to, who you can call. There are HR departments that you never meet uh, because they're always in some, you know, Los Angeles based office somewhere in another world and you're working on a set miles away. But there are people in position, even on small, local, independent stuff that you can talk to and you should feel safe to talk to. Um, I'll end by saying this. Uh, really, at the end of the day, remember why you started remember what it is that got you in to whatever it is that you're doing in the first place. Why is there a giant picture of a hot dog on the screen? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I, I was working as a PA for years and I hit this point where I really wanted to take next steps and I kept getting pushback. I, I thought I had my union paperwork in place. I was gonna join the Directors Guild. That's a whole other story, but it didn't quite work out at the time I wanted, uh, at the time that I wanted it to work out and the way I wanted it to work out. And then a situation presented itself where there was this really uh, angry producer who loved this uh, brand of hot dog. Uh, and I was an office PA for him and, and uh, he was telling me, oh, you gotta get this hot dog. It's called Hoffy Dogs. Uh, go out and buy me a couple. And I, I said, Hoffy Dogs? I've never heard of those. Would you like Nathan's? If you're here on the East Coast in New York, Nathan's is our go-to hot dog brand. He's like, Nathan's, no, ha, Hoffies, I want Hoffies. So I go out, I'm looking everywhere, I'm trying to find Hoffies. I've never heard of the brand, I can't find it anywhere. I think to myself, well, my traditional trials of PAing haven't worked out. Let me, let me put all my time and effort into finding this brand of hot dogs. I spent three weeks, I'm not kidding here, I spent three weeks traveling around everywhere I could imagine to the Walmart and to the Costco out in Long Island, all over these little bodegas in Brooklyn on my own dime and my own time trying to find this brand of hot dog because I thought that this is gonna help advance my career. This is what I need to do. I've learned what I needed to on set as a PA and if I could prove myself to the producer that I can make the impossible happen and make this hot dog appear for him, he'll have to hire me. He'll have to say, oh, I'm gonna make you a producer. This is just the way it goes. And, and some people have stories like this. Well, you probably guess where the story's going. Uh, it didn't work out that way. I found the hot dog by calling the company uh, in the, on the West Coast where they're based and having them overnight a package of hot dogs to me through a third party seller on dry ice. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. I paid an arm and a leg to get them shipped to me that way. And I present the hot dogs to the producer. I didn't even get a thanks. I got a smile. Oh, you can leave them in the fridge. Uh, no thanks, that, that really blew me away. It certainly didn't get a producer offer from it. Um, it's a good reminder that I had gotten a little confused and my long-term goal had kind of become uh, muffled. I wanted to be a filmmaker and a storyteller and I'd gotten so caught up in being the best PA ever and making the impossible happen uh, that my goals were all out of whack. And that was the moment near the end of my PA career, about four or five years in full-time, four years in, that I kind of said, I, I think I'm ready to move on to a different position, even if other people aren't necessarily ready. Um, yeah. 
that's 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 the way it worked out. And there are a lot of ways to get started. This will be the last thing I share. But if anybody's watching who needs a place to go uh, and doesn't know where to go, find mentors. There's plenty of sites. 48 Hour Film uh, Project is a great resource to go and make movies. Uh, you, you work with people. Again, it's all about who you don't know. Um, TV shows like Robert Rodriguez, Rebel Without a Crew. He had a whole TV series where people could go and uh, make their own movie if they want to make a movie or write a movie um, and you could compete in it. Um, I still use Craigslist sometimes. You have to be careful at what you're looking at, but Craigslist, there's Facebook groups. Local Zero Heroes was one of my favorite. There's all sorts of other sites. Um, read books. I just recently read How to Win, Friend, Win Friends and Influence People, and I wish I read that so long ago because just like the Mr. said, Johnny and uh, Rogers, it's all about human connections. Uh, and there's great training programs too. Earlier I mentioned uh, a few people were from the PAGE program. Look up the NBC PAGE program. Check out the mayor's office, the Made in NYPA training program, the DGA AD training program. They're really fantastic programs um, that you can apply to. And yes, they're competitive, but if you keep doing things like this, searching around and putting yourself out there, uh, the only thing that can come back to you is good. Uh, I'll be quiet now and open it up to any other questions that happen to be there. So Daniel, with the time going, we have two questions left. So the first one is, is Brooklyn College Film and Television Department the best equipped of all the CUNY campuses, do you know? And do you recommend Brooklyn College TV and film professors? Uh, I certainly do because I, I, I recommend the professors at Brooklyn College because I learned under them. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to say they're the best definitively because I don't think I could give a good objective response, but I really liked Brooklyn College. I learned a lot there uh, when I did my research of the campuses. I just found that that was the place I was going to learn the most, uh, and I really do think I did. Uh, Macaulay enabled me to do a little work across more than one campus because of its great inter-campus connectivity. Um, and if you go to Macaulay, the good news there is you kind of get a little bit of every campus. So that's what I could say about Brooklyn College. And the last question, what are you working on now in the age of COVID? Well, Holly, uh, I, I'm working on a few things. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I am, as, as I answered earlier, I'm thinking about turning this book into something more than just a book. Um, I actually am working with uh, a few really talented filmmakers at Brooklyn College. I have now sort of come full circle where I used to be at Brooklyn College as a student. Now I am working there. I just recently was hired as a COVID health and safety officer alongside another talented filmmaker and storyteller, Holly. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm working there part time to help the thesis students safely shoot their films um, during this time that we're all living in, working with all the CUNY regulations and, and shooting regulations. So I'm still very much working the freelance world of picking and choosing jobs here and there and trying to, uh, to spin plates and see what stays in the air, I like to say. And if I didn't share it, by the way, I, I'll very quickly just share uh, if, you, if you're if you interested in learning more about the book and reading a couple of these goofy stories and more, uh, paperback or ebook, I have a website, uh, passingplanes.com slash book, uh, and it's available at all those places. So feel free to go take a peek. No pressure. Uh, we're all living in crazy times. And um, the goal of the book was never to uh, make tons and tons of dollars. It was to share life lessons uh, in the best way that I knew how to do. And that was writing my first book. And I'm glad I did it too, because now I could join the ranks of other very talented offers like Lee and, and many other um, people at Macaulay. So uh, passingplanes.com slash book, feel free to take a look at it. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thank you so much, Lee, for joining us. This has been terrific. Lots of great insights into the world of PA and the ways that you showed us on how to move up. Excellent. So thank you so much for sharing your insights and your time with us tonight. I just wanna let everyone know in the audience that there are a lot of other events coming up in the book series. So please stay tuned and look at our calendar. We did post our events calendar on to the chat. So feel free to peruse our website. And again, on behalf of Macaulay, thank you so much for joining us. Bye, Bye Daniel. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.